but, but now what? And so um, the first thing I would tell um, somebody who feels like writing is in their DNA and it's what they're meant to do with their life is to uh, make it a point to start writing every day. It's like exercising, um, swimming laps in a pool. You know, when I think of um, Olympic swimmers like Michael Phelps, you know, he's an amazing swimmer, but he began just like every swimmer begins, you know, in a pool doing laps when no one is watching. And it's those laps in the pool and the, um, the jogs around the track where you're exercising your muscles that end up giving you the strength to do all those amazing things. And um, the writing muscle is that way too. When you exercise it, it's by writing. Like what you just wrote um, today in that little journal entry, you are exercising your writing muscle. It's now stronger than it was before you wrote it. And every, every time you write, you're, you're building up strength in your writing muscle. And so it is good to find the time to write um, and find the time to write what you want to write. So if you're writing right now in school and you're getting assignments that really don't interest you that much is make time to write the things that you want to write about. And if you don't know where to go, like, well, what am I going to write about um, on poetsandwriters.org? So it's just pw.org. They have a writing prompt every day, or maybe it's um, there's a, I know there's a fiction writing prompt once a week, a nonfiction writing prompt once a week, a poetry writing prompt once a week. And so if you feel like, well, I don't know what to write about, you can always go to pw.org and see what their writing prompt is for the week. It's, um, it's a good way of giving, having, having an idea come to you that you didn't have to try and manufacture on your own. And I think um, when you schedule time to write, then it becomes a date with yourself. It's like, it's a commitment you make to yourself um, to, to strengthen your writing muscle. Uh, number two is to break down big ideas into smaller goals. I think sometimes um, when we have a, a writing project that we're supposed to you know, do is it looks very big from the beginning and daunting. And it, um, it, it can almost make people afraid to even start because the project looks so big. So I, when, like, I'm, I'm writing books these days and books are, it's a hundred thousand words, it's 400 pages. It's always daunting when I begin a new book. But what I try and think about when I begin each day is, okay, I'm not writing the whole book today. <laughs> I'm just writing five pages or 10 pages or whatever I've decided is my quota for the day. And that way I'm not thinking about this gigantic looming um, deadline and the amount of words that I have to manufacture to meet it. I'm just looking at today. What do I need to write today? And um, bigger goals are wonderful to have because then it's something to shoot for. Um, but the way to reach those bigger goals is with, is with smaller steps. And so one way of doing that is to just, you know, set for yourself um, a, a smaller goal for the day that'll help you reach the bigger goal, um, but allow you to do it in smaller steps. And number three is to consider that your life is like a classroom. You, um, all of your life, not just your time in the school Zoom room or, or whatever, but your entire life is, is a classroom that you're, you're learning um, from, you're observing life, you are taking notes uh, because of what you're seeing in your life all around you. So um, I've gotten into the habit of observing um, because when you observe, you are adding to your, um, what I would say like a, your, your grocery store of ideas. Because when you start to write, when, you, when you're like writing a story or a novel or a short story, is you begin to um, shop from your mind. You have a grocery store of ingredients in your mind, things that you remembered, like the smell of apple cider that's been spiced with cinnamon sticks. My dad used to make that every Christmas. So that's a memory I have in my mind of what, it, of what spiced apple cider uh, smells like and what it tastes like and what, what it makes the house smell like. And so I, I, have a, I observed that and I remembered it. And I can use that now sometime in a future writing. Everything you experience, every sensory experience that you have is like that, but you have to pay attention to them because otherwise they just become part of the minutia of your day. And um, you, can, you can forget easily what you don't choose to remember. So those are other things that you can write about um, in your daily writing time that's just for you is the different things you experience that day as far as taste and smell and touch and what you heard throughout the day. 
is to write, write it all down because um, number one, you're exercising your writing muscle. Number two, you're writing. Number three, you're writing down something that you can now remember because you put it on, you put it down on paper or on your computer. So it becomes something you can go back to later that you can shop from later when you're trying to write something and you know you need to fill the scene with um, sensory type uh, elements is you can go back to all the experiences that you've been, that you've been purposefully recording and, and then use them. Number four is to, um, is to take a class either online or in real time. It's, it's hard when you're a student in high school because your classwork is pretty much, um, it's, it's portioned out for you. But you know, like um, during summer breaks or during a time when you have just extra time to maybe have another class in addition to your schoolwork is, is to take a class. If you can take a community college class as a high school student, a lot of colleges let you do that. Um, you can take an online class, just um, different um, places offer online writing classes, just to be able to have someone um, teach you to uh, write the kinds of things that you want to write. When you're in high school, a lot of times you're writing, um, you're writing to be able to graduate high school and pursue the next thing. So it's, it's a little bit regimented, but if you take a writing class, that's about the types of things that you wanna write, well, then you're opening up your mind to a whole new uh, array of things. Like if you, if you decide that someday you want to write your life story, or maybe you want to write the life story of a grandparent because their life is fascinating. So you're gonna be writing like a memoir of yourself or a, or a biography of them. Well, I would take a class on that to find out, well, how do you write a memoir about your own life? Or how do you write a biography about someone else's life and make it interesting and make it seem like it, it's real and it really happened? Um, a class can help you do that. And um, maybe right now life is too busy for a class, but just always remember that you can always be learning even after high school is over, even if um, you decide college isn't for you, um, you can still always take a class, you can always be learning. And uh, I, I think that there's always something to be learned even, even as we age. So number five is to join a local writers group. Um, this is because um, it's sometimes, um, good to get feedback from other people. You know, sometimes feedback um, is not helpful, that, that can happen, but more, more often than not, feedback from a peer, someone who's your age and kind of at the same life experience as you, um, more often than not, they can give you like um, um, information that um, allows you to look at your piece that you've written as, as a reader rather than its writer. And so feedback um, is, it's, don't get, it's not considered criticism really, um, unless um, they didn't like what you wrote, but feedback is often positive or it's suggestive, like, well, have you tried this? Or, or maybe um, if you went this direction and you, you often can't see those things if you're the writer, because the, the writer brain is a little bit different than the reader brain. And if you're in a writer's group, you know, you're, your writer group friends, they're, they're your readers. And so they're responding to what you've written as, as a reader and um, feedback um, can be helpful. I, I think at the end of the day, you need to be happy with what you wrote. So it could, it could be that you've, you've been given advice from different people that have read what you've written and you're like, no, the way I've got it is the way it needs to be. And uh, you, you can always stand behind your work but it's nice to get feedback um, to find out, um, well, how are people responding to what I've written? Because usually what you write, you write to be read. And so now you've got people reading it. It's good to hear what they have to say because it, it can open up your mind to possibilities that you wouldn't have um, thought of um, on your own. Number six is to um, write, to read good stuff. There's a lot of fun literature out there just, um, they're, they're books that are, they're just there to entertain and they don't have a lot of, um, um, there's not a lot of body to them, if that makes any sense. Um, you owe it to yourself, I think, to read the good stuff. There's lots of good books out there. And every time you read a good book, um, it, it becomes a part of you. And I think it becomes a part of your writing then too, because it informs your writing. And so like in high school, I'm trying to remember the books that I loved the most. Like in high school, I read The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. 
And that was a long time ago. And I still remember it about the, how the writing was and just the way it made me feel. And um, it, it was evocative writing. It made me think and feel and sense things. Um, and there's, there's lots of books that are considered what we consider classics that, that will do that for you. But there's also books that are not considered classics. They're not books that you'd be assigned in school, but they're still, you can just tell when you start to read it, this is not just here to entertain me. Um, this is here to like speak to me. And um, there's only so much time um, that you have for reading, um, for, for this kind of reading. So I would say just read good stuff. And I would say the same thing for like um, when you're binge watching on Netflix or whatever is to think about, well, what, what is this show? How is this show informing my writing? Um, because a lot of shows that are just for jokes, they're, they are entertaining. I'll give you that, but they're not, they're not, they're not improving my writing in any way. Like, like a really good show, like a really good, well-written show on Netflix. I can tell that the writers, they're thinking about how the watcher is going to feel. And um, I, I think at the end of a really good show where the writing is really good, I think it does affect my writing. So I'm not saying don't watch any fluff, but just know that the fluff that you're watching isn't probably going to inform your writing. It's fun. It's good for relaxation and all of that. But if you're looking to bump up your writing, is, um, is be um, a curator of what you're watching and um, look, you look for shows that have been you know, critically acclaimed um, that you know, like uh, critically acclaimed means that you know critics you, critics like movie critics and tv show critics they have found it to be like a step above some of the other shows out there and those are the types of um, shows that i think um, can have a, an effect on your writing so i would go, just go for the good stuff um, number seven is to keep an idea file. And so what I do is if I read something in the newspaper or uh, an article on the internet and it interests me for whatever reason, either it's about a person who did something remarkable or somebody who experienced something rather extraordinary, um, I'll just print it out and save it. Sometimes it's okay just to save the link somewhere, but links can expire. And I've just learned that if I just print it out, then I'll have it. So I have an idea file on my computer where I just have links of things that interested me, but I also have an idea file in my desk drawer of articles that I've printed out that are of interest to me. Like for example, um, you know, during, um, during the war, World War II, there were um, female code breakers in England. They, they deciphered codes from the enemy and um, were able to um, find out what the enemy moves were going to be. And it, that, that to me is fascinating that there were these women who couldn't talk about what they were doing. Their husbands and fathers and brothers thought they were, had a dumb old secretarial job and all they were doing is tapping a, a keyboard all day. It had nothing to do with anything, but they were actually breaking breaking codes. That to me is fascinating. So if I see an article about those code breaking women, I would probably print it out and tuck it away because I, you never know when something like that's going to be useful to you. Um, number nine is um, to invite your family and close friends to hold you accountable. And what I mean by that is, let's say you've decided, um, you've set some writing goals for yourself, maybe, maybe just to write every day or to write um, three times a week, whatever you decide. Well, how are you going to um, come? Like, how are you going to hold yourself to that? Um, if no one knows that's what you've decided, then you can really easily not do it and forget that you even wanted to. So if you decide, I really do want to become a better writer. I want to get better at this. So my goal is to write um, a poem every week or my goal is to uh, write in my journal three times a week. You need to tell somebody that's your goal and tell them, I want you to hold me accountable. What they can do then, like if you, if you set a goal, I wanna write in my journal three times a week, is you tell a friend or a sibling or a parent and say, ask me at the end of the week if I've done it. And if I haven't, this is what you can require of me. So you can make it matter. 
So let's say uh, if, if I haven't written what I said I wanted to write, um, I will clean your room. Or if I haven't written what I said I was going to write, I will mow the lawn or whatever it is that is fun for them and not fun for you because then they'll enjoy holding you accountable and you will probably get your writing done. And what holds me accountable is I have a deadline. So I, I agreed, I have a publishing contract. I have a deadline that holds me accountable. I signed on the dotted line. I have a legal obligation now um, to meet it. But when you don't have a legal obligation, it's good to find an obligation of some kind. Um, when I was much younger and my kids were still little, I, I would say to them, hold me accountable. This is how much mommy wants to write today. And if I don't do it, I'll take you all out for ice cream. <laughs> well, uh, they wanted the ice cream, but um, what we would do instead is if I, if I made, the, uh, made the goal, we'd, we'd reverse it and I would take them out for ice cream. It was kind of fun because sometimes they would go out of their way to let me have my space so I could get it done so we could have the ice cream. And in, in any case, if you involve the people that matter to you in your goals and they want you to succeed anyway, then they become a part, they become a part of your making your goals and they become a part of um, you keeping at it because you've, you've brought them in and made them part of it by saying, hold me accountable. I want to get this done. I want you to help me. Um, the last thing is, is to um, just start. It's hard to start something because um, it, it, writing, writing can be, um, it can be difficult. You can start and feel like you get started and like, now I, I thought I knew what I was going to say and I've only written a page and now I, I, now I don't know where to go with it. Um, starting is really a brave thing to do. Um, a lot of people think someday I'll write a book and they never even begin. So if you feel like, yeah, someday I want to write a book, well then um, I would say set a date to start and then, and then start. It's going to be hard. There are going to be days when you're going to want to um, throw in the towel, as they say, you're going to feel like I don't have what it takes to write this. Um, you'll want to just drop it. And there's nothing wrong with abandoning something that's not going to work. But the thing is, you won't know if it's not going to work for quite a while. In fact, you can abandon something that really is just getting started. And so it's a, it's a matter of keeping at it. Um, I would say um, past the point where you think it's, it's, you should just put it away, throw it away. You know, keep at it um, at least four or five more times when you feel that way, <laughs> just because you'll never know when all of a sudden you realize you're in the groove and all of that writing you did before it all, it's all starting to make sense. Um, a lot of it happens um, in the process, not before. And I think it might be like a painter who's painting, you know, they start out with a sketch, they start putting color on the canvas and they step back and look at it and they might think, man, that looks terrible. Well, probably, yeah, um, it's not done. It's not near done. And, uh, but they keep, they keep at it and they keep putting paint on the canvas and it begins to take shape. In fact, it might not really even look like anything until they're more than halfway finished. And so uh, it would have been really sad if they had just stopped um, at the, you know, 10% mark. Um, so, you know, keep at it. You're, you're painting something too. Um, you're, just, you're not using paint though. You're using words and, um, and your mind to, you know, to create these words out of nothing. And it's hard. And so um, just know that there's gonna be times where it's gonna feel like um, what you've started is just not going anywhere. But I would say stay with it um, five times when you feel that way. And if you really feel like at the sixth time you feel that way, I would say, don't throw it away, just put it away. It might be that what you're writing right then is not the time, it's not the time for it, but it will be someday. And uh, you did spend some time on it, so just put it away. In a, in a drawer somewhere or in a file on your computer and just and just know that it's there for you, waiting for you um, should the time ever come where you feel like you're ready um, to, to start over again with it. Anyway, I hope that's helpful to you. I feel like these are some of the things that I learned as I went along, kind of like um, on the job training, I guess, because I became a writer 
by um, want, wanting to give it a try. And then I kind of learned along the way um, how to really make it, um, make it work for me. And I'm really glad for the people in my life that affirmed me. And so I, I, I would implore you to, to find those people that can affirm you in your writing. I had a teacher at Poway High School who I, I had him for my freshman composition class who went out of his way to, to tell me that I had a gift. And I wasn't even that great of a writer then, but he saw, I think he saw the promise in me and he, he kept telling me, this is good, this is good, you should publish this. And um, you know, I was only 14 when I was a freshman in high school. And I've already told you I was in my forties before I wrote my first book. But I can tell you, I still remembered his comments to me. All those years, 30 years later, I remembered what he told me and it filled me with the confidence to give it a try. And so um, I, I think there are probably people out there who can affirm you too and you know, be looking for those people. And when you do get that affirmation from somebody like an adult, a teacher, a parent, someone whose uh, opinion really matters to you and they affirm you as a writer, okay, hold on to that, write it down if you can so that you remember it. Cause you'll wanna, you'll wanna remember it when you decide to give writing a try is to kind of have that affirmation kind of in the back of your mind on the back burner and um, that kind of affirmation can really give you wings to fly. So I hope this was helpful to you. I, I um, admire all of you young writers who are just starting out. I hope that you um, find all kinds of ways to um, make use of these strange times we're in. These are great times to be journaling. They're not great times for a whole lot else, but they are a great time for journaling because I think we're discovering things about ourselves during this time of the pandemic, things that won't be repeated. You're gonna be the generation that lived through it. And so um, usually when a, when a world, a nation travels through a difficult, difficult road, people come out on the other side different. And we'll, we're gonna be learning things in this situation that we're in that we're probably gonna take with us into the rest of our, our lives. So journal what you are experiencing, what you're feeling right now. Um, It'll be interesting, I think, 20 years from now, when we all think back of what it was like to live through the, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, people are going to be looking at us the way people looked back, the people that, you know, survived other, like the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and, and you know, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and all these historic events that kind of changed. They changed the nation and, and for some of these events changed the world. So be writing about it. I don't think you'll regret that. It's my pleasure to spend this time with you. I hope you have a great rest of the school year. Um, uh, I salute you for your um, the way you're having to do school these days. It's really amazing what you guys are accomplishing in a very strange way. So keep at it. Uh, all of you, all of the adults in your life are very proud of you. All right, have a great rest of the day. Bye bye.